Coming up on today's Locked On Senators, Ottawa falls short 4-3, the final score against the Leafs in what you could call anything but a battle of Ontario. And they'll try to bounce back up against another division rival as they visit Patty Showtime Kane and the Red Wings in Detroit. The only Showtime I acknowledge is Shohei Otani. But we also have some more Senators news. Thomas Shabbat has been moved to the LTIR. We'll explain what that means and how it's allowing the Sens to make a call-up in the form of Yuri Smekal. All that on today's edition of the Locked On Senators podcast. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Jake Sanderson, and you're listening to Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Tim Stützle, and you're listening to the Locked On Senators Podcast. Welcome inside episode 934 of the Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan in the heart of our nation's capital in Ottawa, Ontario, alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains. You can follow the show on social media. We're at Send Central on Twitter, LockedOn.Senators on Instagram. The show is free and available on all podcast platforms, including on YouTube, where a like, comment, and subscription go a long way to helping the show grow. Today's episode is not the happiest of shows, but I can tell you today is Friday, December 8th in Pilsy. Well, it's pretty clear when I have my voice the day after a Sens game, things didn't go the way that we hoped. Yeah, this is definitely uh, one of your best voice recovery days after a Sens game, that's for sure, especially up against the Toronto Maple Leafs. You'd think this would have gone a little bit differently, and this had the potential to go differently. The Ottawa Senators, for all accounts, other than the scoreboard really, controlled this game they out shooting them what 44 to 22 or 41 to 22 i think like the the coursey numbers are in the sens favor but it all comes down to goaltending in this one and joseph wool played a lot better than anton forsberg did he he was unreal like those two glove saves you think of of the uh Huge. tim stutzla pass to tarasenko and i mean in the building in the moment i'm looking i'm saying why doesn't tarasenko one time that but the puck was passed a little behind and we know tarasenko is a stop up shooter would yeah. prefer to get a handle on it instead he gives wool enough time to get over and then he tries doing the one timer on the next feed cross seam play and in the second period wool makes a, an unbelievable save to uh, to alleviate that opportunity for Ottawa, but this game, yeah, it's one of inches where we had crossbars both ways. Matthews hit one, Brady hit one on a breakaway, and it just came down to Wool making that extra save. And not that I look at any of the goals against Forsberg, maybe the wraparound one. Second one, yeah. You you probably hope he has that, but uh, outside of that, man, it's it's just too bad that he wasn't able to elevate to where Wool was. I think instead of being like, oh, you know, Forsberg's brutal or, or he's letting in too many goals, the save percentage again, not great at all, but to yep. me, it's it's in the battle. It's you look down at the other end, and if he's making save after save, you have to give your team that same opportunity to get the extra goal. Ottawa does score f- first in this game. Josh Norris, right after a great penalty kill at the end of the first period, you know, Chikrin makes a great play. I thought it was going to be called back for offside, and again, I was I was way up in the three hundred, so I didn't have the best view. But as Sheldon Keefe is just waiting, whether he's going to challenge or not, everyone in our section, you know, you get to a point where it's like, are you still celebrating the goal? Like it's been a minute. And I said, you know what? If Sheldon Keefe's going to, you know, make this stretch out for as long as possible, that's just more time to celebrate. So we had some Leaf fans giving it to us from behind. I just completely ignored him. Didn't even like acknowledge that they existed. Then he's starting, you know, get, give the old lean in woo when the Leaf score and, you know, just didn't have any time for that. So however many Leaf fans you think are going to be at a Battle of Ontario, there's always more. They're literally rodents. They just crawl through the cracks and ugh, just brutal. But uh, yeah, unfortunate result to that game. But at the end of the day, you, you can kind of look at it and say, yeah, it sucks, but they des- they deserve to win that game. They really did. And and I know that there's no moral victories at this point in the, the rebuild, if we can even call it that, but th- this no. team is well beyond those those moral wins. But it, it, it does really suck when the team plays well enough to win but can't get it done. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough. And look, Leafs fans should be able to have empathy for us. How many years did they have where they missed the playoffs and they weren't even rebuilding? They just sucked. Uh, so they definitely can uh, understand what's going on here with the Ottawa Senators. And the thing is, Ross, like Forsberg, I keep going back to this. He's one of those goalies that he needs to be feeling the puck. 20 shots, 22 shots. He's not going to be able to get into the groove. He's not going to be able to kind of get into the game the way he wants. And I don't know, like I'm not advocating for the Sens defensive structure to become even worse and allow more shots, but it just seems like it's pretty clear cut. Whenever Forzy doesn't have a lot of shots, he's not that great. And then when he gets a lot of shots, he's able to battle and uh, help this team get, get the dub. And yeah, I, I, I'm not putting this loss on Forzy, but it all comes down to Wool was a better goalie than Forsberg in this one. Like the the Marner goal, that's not on Forzy. That's a, a defensive lapse, a bad line change, a great pass. And then Mitch Marner, as much as I hate him, he's a good player and he picks a good spot. The William Nylander goal as well. Again, that was another defensive lapse by the Senators, and that's a shot where Forzy can't even see it. Chickren's in front of him, so I don't, I don't have too much issue with that. So I don't know. It's it's just tough because last year, Ross, you can look at this and you can take the moral victory. You, you can do it, but this year, you can't. You can't do it. And if you're gonna get that close, you got to get closer and get that loser point. You got to do it. And Josh Norris. He took accountability. He got three shot opportunities in the, the final minute there where the Sens had a six on four power play. He's not able to convert on those. That's one where I feel like Josh Norris of two seasons ago, he puts one of those in. Like he he just, he doesn't have the same kind of zip on that one timer from that spot. It's still a great option, but it's not as automatic as it felt like it used to be. And maybe part of that, Ross, is teams are checking the game notes and they're aware of it. But either way, so close, but not close enough. No, that's just it. And, and the Senators threw everything at the net. 17 shots on goal in the third period. They had the uh, the fortunate, of course, it's an unfortunate circumstance. You never want to see anybody get hurt. But Joseph Wall was playing lights out. He leaves the game with just under 10 minutes to go. And then Martin Jones, he of fame for giving Ottawa the opportunity to draft him Stutzla because he has such a bad year in San Jose uh, in 2019-2020. So he comes in and immediately the Sens are able to bring it within one goal. Like it was pretty bang, bang. Uh, or sorry, they, they had a couple of good chances, I should say, right away. And they did let Jones feel the puck. Uh, Giroux ends up getting that goal on on the, uh, the five, or sorry, six on five. Yeah. Then they get the power play. And that's where you're like, okay, they they proved they proved they can score with the goalie out because that had been a problem for yes. such a long time. It's like you get one, but then you still lose. Like even when you get the goal with the goalie out, you still come up short. So that's something again that the Sens are going to have to find a way to work on. But when you talk about the defensive lapses, two of the goals were a direct result of bad line yes. changes. Now. Yep. A great hit from Matthew Nyes on Ridley Gregg, one of the few physical moments in the game. Great hit. Like, I love that. Now, you look at the other physical moment. Ridley Gregg gets a penalty, and the defenseman's turning into the boards and putting himself in the position. That, to me, is is just a hard hit, and, and you have to be able to, to withstand that and not get called all the time. But when you look at the line change there, right after the Ridley Gregg hit, either grab the guy who threw the hit if you know that the play is not going, but they literally just go D to D up and it's a three on one like that quickly, bang, bang. So it's an, again, line changes, too many men penalties, which didn't happen last night, but the senators have had probably the most, if not their top five in most too many men penalties over the last number of years. So these are just details of the game where if I'm Jacques Martin, this is what I'm looking at and saying, how can we avoid these little errors that are causing big discrepancies when it comes down to the final score in the game. So Ottawa loses 4-3. There was a couple of good moments in the game, though, including Jacob Bernard Docker scoring yep. his first National Hockey League goal. Pilsy took him a while to get there, but he is really settling himself into a role as an everyday NHLer. I mean, it took until his 48th career game, but here he is, NHL goal scorer. Yeah, that was nice to see for JBD. And for a guy that's usually very calm, cool, and collected, uh, he let his emotions show there. He gave the big fist pump pretty much uh, right at center ice. I mean, 
for a first NHL goal for a guy that's not really an offensive player, that was a beautiful goal. He waits for the puck to bank off the boards, winds up the slap shot, and boom, hammers it in. So you got to feel good for JVD there, especially that kind of uh, gave life back to the Senators, but it's too bad. I really thought, Ross, when uh, the Leafs took that penalty at the end of the game, that was going to be one of those hockey gods, puck don't lie moments where it's like, okay, Hasn't gone the Sens way, but here is the ultimate gift on a platter after you scored with the goalie pulled. Now you got a six on four. Go get it done again and bring this game to overtime. But we we were smited by the hockey gods instead. So JBD gets his first NHL goal. The other scores for Ottawa, Claude Giroux and Josh Norris. On the back end, I'm looking at Chikrin and Hamannick. Dash two in this game. Hamannick plays a game low, 15-26. At some point, Pilsy, like, are they going to have to address this as a legit issue? Because Thomas Shabbat isn't coming back. We're going to get to that in a little while. He's not coming back for at least a month. They're going to have to ride out what's going on with this decor. And to me, like, Hamannick is by far costing them, like, games at this point. Well, the concerning thing is, Ross, like, Thomas Shabbat came back for two games, right? And in those two games, the first game up against Columbus, JBD was the odd man out. You're thinking, okay, that's that's weird, but it's just one game, whatever. Next game, nobody out on the back end, 11-7. and seven. So that makes me concerned that if Shabbat hadn't been injured and was still in the lineup, that DJ Smith and the coaching staff wouldn't have done what they should have done and put Travis Hamannick up in the press box. Now, I'm not saying send the guy to Robidaw Island or Klingberg Island or Matt Murray Island or how many people can fit on an island? Joffrey Lupul, Jake Martin. <laughs> yeah, few. That island's getting crowded. Um, but I do think at some point, and this is what we talk about with accountability, like you got to hold guys accountable. Hamnick has not been good recently. You got to hold him accountable and take him out of the lineup. Even if Ross, it's not done in a disciplinary way. Uh, he doesn't need to be the scapegoat of this team and uh, be kind of uh, a guy that they send a message to. It's just a matter of fact, hey, we're trying to win hockey games. We believe there's better players that we can put in the lineup that will give us a chance to do that. And we said it from the start when Hamnick was uh, signed this extension, Ross. Like, there were Twitter, since Twitter kind of lost its mind over it, and we were like, okay, it's not that big of a deal because we think and we hope that Hamnick ends up playing the Nick Holden role where he's like a seventh defenseman. Maybe he plays somewhere between 40 and 60 games. If there's injuries, he can fill in uh, in a third pairing role. But unfortunately, that hasn't really been the case for Hamnick, and he's really starting to look out of place here. It's really starting to get concerning. Now, there was not a roster move made on the back end, but up front, Yuri Smekal is getting his opportunity with the big club. He's been recalled ahead of tomorrow's game against the Detroit Red Wings. The Sens are off today, so we'll predict, project where we think Smekal will fit in and also look at what this LTIR placement, long-term injured reserve, means for Thomas Shabbat. Plus, the weekend preview, we'll look at what Detroit is cooking up recently. All that on today's episode, coming up on Locked On Senators. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at eBay Motors. Guys, passion, drive, and patience, that's what brings home the winning trophy, and it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whatever you want, you can find it at eBay Motors. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, they've got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time, or you get your money back. It's simple. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not burning cash. With all the parts you need, the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that dub. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusive supply, eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Check it out today, guys. eBay Motors. Today's episode is also brought to you by Farm to Fork. Farm to Fork Delivery.ca. They serve premium meat and seafood 
available anywhere in Ontario. You can also find them in Quebec and to our friends up north in Nunavut. You can go to farm2forkdelivery.ca, and that's the number two there, and see for yourself all these great antibiotic-free, hormone-free products that are available to you in bulk so you can be able to have whatever you need for dinner that night. And also, you don't have to worry about having to be like, oh, man, I pulled out all that salmon. We have to find a way to eat it. No, with Farm to Fork, everything is hand carved at the butcher's table and then individually vacuum sealed and flash frozen to keep premium freshness inside and you will not have to worry about having pulling out more than you'd want in that sitting so make sure you stock up for the winter it's great too because they have free delivery and convenient delivery they have an app that really tracks where your delivery driver is so you know when your premium meat and seafood is arriving to you go check them out for specials they got all sorts of things on their website i love checking out their bundles where you can save even more how about the steak and scallop bundle how about the dinner party duo bundle get some ribeyes get some bacon wrapped chicken breast they've got all sorts of great products at farm to fork delivery.ca it's also a local ottawa company so you're supporting local when you support farm to fork and because you're a listener of locked on centers we know you're going to love it so we're giving you 10 percent off your first purchase by using our promo code losp10 that's losp10 for 10 percent off your first purchase at farm to fork delivery.ca taste the farm to fork difference you will never go back to grocery store meats All right, Pilsy, here we are heading into another weekend where the Senators find themselves below 500. Every time they get to 500, they immediately go back and lose. Like, how do we get out of this funk? All I want is for a team to be above 500, and I know, games in hand. We talked about that last night in the postcast. Games in hand. They are very real, but the Senators keep finding ways to lose their games in hand, and I would like them to find a way to win three or four games in a row because we were old, we didn't even say it on yesterday's show because it's such a sad stat oh, that no. yesterday was the first time the Senators were going into the 21st game of the season. So after they played 20 games under DJ Smith where they were at 500, a mediocre 10 and 10 record and they couldn't build on it. And that's what's really frustrating. We just we already dissected the game where it's like, okay, you play that game 100 times, the Sens probably win it 75% of the time. But it doesn't matter. Fans in this in this uh, community, in this, you know, the citizens are tired of morale points, and, and they don't count at all in the standings. Unfortunately, morale points have not yet been introduced. They're talking about it at the Board of Governors meeting, though, Ross. Um, Ross, I'll lower the bar even lower than being better than 500. I would like to not have carpal tunnel from scrolling down the standings when I'm looking for the Ottawa Senators last in the Atlantic division last in the Eastern conference. I mean, 29th in the NHL. Yes. If these games in hand don't go how I've scheduled them to go, which is an automatic two points for every single game in hand they have this, this is going to be rough. It's going to be, it's going to be tough sledding moving forward. And this conference, this division it's not going to get any easier as the year goes on because teams are going to start jockeying for position and figure out where they are and start bolstering their lineups. So I don't know. This this month of December is is going to be a very interesting spot to see where the Sens can put themselves for the new year. What was your thoughts? And and I just walked in on this. I felt like, you know, walking in on something inappropriate that you shouldn't be seeing. And oh. that was when Mark Mathot was wearing a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey at intermission like tell me the backstory on this because i wasn't there until i walked in i was in the line for for a pint and i look over and mark method is wearing a toronto maple leafs jersey yeah disgusting appalling atrocious uh i don't have my thesaurus out so i'll stop there but all all the synonyms of disgusting uh, can be used to describe that image you saw and we're not prepared to see ross that's tough because the viewers at home were prepared for it uh, I believe I didn't get the full story. I missed uh, the the pregame, but I believe O'Neill and Meth had a mayor's bet. Who's ever winning at the end of the period, uh, the losing team has to wear the opponent's jersey. So O Dog, 
he wore the Sens jersey. I mean, lucky guy. Like, to lose a bet and that is your punishment, you get to wear a fresh 2D home jersey in the CTC. I mean, that's awesome. And then Meth, unfortunately, the Leafs are up 2-1 at the end of the second, and he's got to don that uh, that blue Leafs jersey. And he can't even keep it on for the full segment. I mean, if you're gonna if we're gonna give uh, Meth some props here, it's at least he was like, "Nope, I'm I'm breaking this bet. I'm done," and he rips it off. So it was a tough scene for sure. And you know what? We've been talking smack about uh, Meth doing that. Martian has, but. We got to give Meth the chance to defend himself. So hopefully he'll uh, come on the show next week to try to defend his case here. It's not going to be easy though. Well, the we'll evidence the is decide. the evidence is against him. Well, in the moment, I I gave him an indefinite suspension. Now it can yes. be appealed, and we will keep you updated on that process throughout the weekend. Our lawyers will be deliberating over the weekend, yep. and on Monday we will have more information for you about Jersey Gate with Mark Mathot and the Toronto. Maple Leafs. And it should be noted, though, and this does work. And, and again, I'm not trying to put my lawyer in a bad position as we oh. discussed over the weekend. But Mark Mathot did reject a trade to the Toronto Maple Leafs in the summer of 2017. So that does need to be heard by the jury. So we'll we'll discuss that later on. Another defenseman, another left shot defenseman who bleeds Ottawa, Thomas Shabbat, out for at least four weeks. Now, being placed on long term injured reserve does open up cap space. But it's also meaning that he's going to miss at least 10 games and 24 days. So he's not going to be eligible to play until 2024. A, a significant blow for the Ottawa Senators. But, I mean, they've they've also had to play without him already a bunch this season. So it's not like it's going to be something that's brand new for them. Well, I think, Ross, actually, uh, Garak was saying he would be eligible to return up against the Leafs on the 27th. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a math guy, so yeah, 24 plus 8. Oh, it's retroactive, though. That's what it is. It's oh, retroactive okay. to the day that he was injured. So there you go. That makes sense. Okay, good, because I was like, wait, that math isn't adding up. But uh, yeah, I, I I got a feeling they're going to hold him out till the new year. I don't know. I just, I don't have a good feeling about this. I'm, I'm doing my best to tell myself it's not that big of a deal and this team is going to figure it out without him, but... It's, it's not good because uh, unless this coaching staff decides to look elsewhere other than Travis, Travis Hamannick for someone to play right uh, shot D on the third pair, I, I don't see this getting much better, especially with a tight schedule coming up. Would you be of the mind that maybe you give someone in Belleville an opportunity on the right side? Like we saw an espresso shot of Nicholas Martin Palo. And also our friend Damian Smith just pointed out too that Max Gannett's up to 15 points in 20 games right now for the uh, for the Belleville Sens. And for that, that obviously for them is leading all defense. But he's actually the second top scorer on the team, only behind Angus Crookshank. One quick note, and then I want your take on uh, on the Sens decor right now. Angus Crookshank had a scary collision against Laval in a 5-2 win on Wednesday. Uh, but he sources have told Locked On Senators that uh, it was, uh, how was it described to me, that Hopefully he plays tonight, but if not, don't expect it to be long term. It is a bone bruise. So just a bone bruise in what could have been a scary incident because it was the same knee that was buckled and that forced him to miss an entire season. So good news, encouraging yep. news on Angus Crookshank. But Pilsy, I only brought him up because he's one point ahead of Max Gannett, who leads all B sends in, in scoring by defenseman. Yeah, I mean, Ross, Matt Timpalo had his opportunity. Now, how much of an opportunity was that? Not a huge one. I, I'm willing to admit that, obviously, only averaging about seven minutes of ice time in the four games that he did play, but just didn't move the needle too much for me here. So at, at this point, if you're the Ottawa Senators, there can't be any politics. There can't be any looking who's making how much money because now that Shabbat's on LTIR, it doesn't matter. Uh, there can't be hierarchy of seniority or anything like that. Who are the best players? Like, just give me who's playing good in, bad out, simple. Max Gannett's playing good in the AHL. Now, does that translate automatically to the NHL? No, absolutely not, especially for a, a young guy like Max Gannett. But I think at this point, you, you got to start trying different stuff, especially, Ross, with how compact the schedule is. Like, just trotting out Hamnick over and over and over and over and over again. I, I don't see a way where that gets better. Well, we'll discuss one change we expect to be made 
on Saturday when the Senators visit the Detroit Red Wings. Preview of that game coming up next. You're listening to Locked On Senators. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at Jace Medical. Guys, I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of real life, but let's just talk for a minute about preparing for real life. According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics right in the middle of worst flu season in over a decade. That's scary. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if me or someone I cared about was sick with a supply chain issue that kept them from having the life-saving medication they need and deserve. Thankfully, that doesn't have to happen with Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses. And this stuff could happen to any of us. And it's important to be prepared. So visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It'll be reviewed by a board certified physician and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. Again, guys, that's jacemedical.com. Use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. Don't get caught unprepared. Check out Jace Medical. I'm always prepared when I come to Ottawa because I visit Shawarma Palace. Today's episode is brought to you by Shawarma Palace. And if you could be on the receiving end of that, you would know that I ate shawarma palace for breakfast because the garlic sauce is so delicious. We got the platters. I did the classic move, Pilsy. You'll love this one. We we're on our way back from the Glebe Central Pub, and I said, Wes, we, we got it. And Wes, by the way, star of yesterday's show, five guys came up to him at the game. was like, oh, heard you on Locked On Sense. Absolute blast. Thanks to Wes for joining us. And when it comes to Shawarm Palace, Wes and I decided, hey, why don't we have a little treat waiting for us when we get back to Chateau Levitan? So sure enough, we pull up in the Uber, and what's waiting right on the doorstep? It's that delicious shawarma palace. So, you know, had a few bites before you go to bed, wake up in the fridge, perfect leftovers. You don't even have to heat it up. It is so delicious. Put it in the wrap, and away you go. I'm always a platter guy. Love the extra garlic, but if you want a quick grab and go, you can visit any of their seven locations and just grab the sandwich as you expect. It's delicious. It's from 1997 till today. The Shawarma Palace brand has been growing and growing. We saw they were in the mix at the Canadian Tire Center. There's uh, All the branding is there. I'm pushing for a, a, a location at the CTC. I need that in my veins. I Ross. need it. They had a commercial for Shawarma Palace, and our guy, Abbas, was in the commercial. I saw that. I was fired up. Amazing. Shawarma Palace. Eat like a royal today. Go eat at Shawarma Palace. All right, Pilsy. As we head into an important weekend matchup against the Detroit Red Wings, where, stop me if you've heard this before, the Senators can get back to 500 with a win as the uh, Sens enter this game with a 10 and 11 record in 21 games. Meanwhile, the Detroit Red Wings continue to roll. They're 6 2 and 2 in their last 10 games. They've played 25 games, so they have played three, four more than the Ottawa Senators. They have a 14 7 and 4 record. That's also what's really disappointing to me here is all these teams with three, four OT points, and then games like last where the Senators just cannot even get to overtime. Now they are 2 and 0. Oh. When they get to overtime, so they get one, they get two. I get it. They've been to overtime, and they come out on the right side of it. But still, these one points just seem to add up. It's like, okay, Detroit's got four more wins than Ottawa, but they've played four more games. But it's like, no, because then if even if Ottawa wins those extra games, they don't have that because the loser points are killing me. But Pilsy. This game here, Patrick Kane, it will be his second game with the Red Wings. He was in their loss to San Jose last night, overtime loss. But San Jose, for somehow, some way, is rolling right now. So it's not even like, oh, they lost to San Jose. They're the worst team in the league. San Jose, I think they're 5-2-2 two, and two in their last nine games. Yeah, San Jose has been better, Ross. But, I mean, and Ottawa Senators fans know about this, but losing a lead, the Detroit Red Wings were up 4 nothing in the second period and they lost six, wow. five. Wow. <laughs> I didn't even, I didn't even recognize that. So that yeah. in itself is, is pretty, pretty, in, you know, indicting. So they're going to probably have a hard practice today, or at least, you know, some video meetings trying to, you know, change things up. Now, is this the first team that Ottawa will have played three times this season has to be? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's gotta be. And Ross, the crazy thing about that game is 
the Sharks and Red Wings scored six goals in three minutes and one second. There were six goals in three minutes in that game. It was wild. Wow. Okay. So we're expecting a wild game too, because Ottawa actually blew a four nothing lead the last time they played Detroit. And that game went to overtime. Tim Stutzla steps up, does yep. his best Shohei Otani impression. Tim Stutzla, he swings, he shoots, he scores. And uh, that was an awesome way to win that game. 5-4 in Sweden. And obviously in Ottawa earlier this year, the Senators fell 5-2. And, uh, and the, or was it 5-3? 5-2? It was a you and Mar- it was a you and Martian postcast, which means that it was probably it was five, five two. two. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. five two for that game. Now, when you look at what Detroit brings, we'll get to that in a moment. However, Yuri Smakeout is being called up, and we're going to have to do our best guess because, as I, we mentioned earlier, the Senators are off today. But this is how we're expecting the Senators to line up in tomorrow's game. And that's the same as they did against the Toronto Maple Leafs, Josh Norris with Brady Kachuk and Claude Giroux. It's Tim Stutzla with Vladimir Tarasenko and Drake Batherson. It's Ridley Gregg between Dominic Kubelik and Matthew Joseph. But then we're thinking that much like what happened when Highmore came up and they, they moved Parker Kelly to the right side. They put Smake out on, on left wing here with Rourke Chartier in the middle of the ice. On defense, we expect it to be the same. Jake Sanderson, Jacob Bernard Docker, Travis Hamannick on the right side with Jacob Chikrin, and then Eric Branstrom with Artem Zub. And I almost feel the need here to switch those two pairings up because Branstrom and Zub were much more relied upon than Chikrin and Hamannick in last night. And they actually played a bit better as well. So that'll be interesting to note, but... Well, where where do you see Smake Al fitting in? Like, is this a good spot for him? Or we've been talking about Kubelik being an underperformer this year. Like, would you what kind of opportunity would you give Yuri Smake Al right off the bat? No, I'm keeping him on that fourth line there, Ross. Um, yeah, Kubelik has been underwhelming, but I don't think the answer is giving him less opportunities and putting him back with Rourke Chartier. I don't think that's gonna be the answer. And I kind of want to see how Schmeichel does up up at the NHL level. Sure, he was buzzing in preseason, but let's see how he does uh, in the regular season here. So just keep him on that bottom line. Plus, he's got some size. I know he's not the most physical guy, but he's got some size, so he can uh, at least um, tough it out with some of the other bottom six guys. So that's where I'd have him, left for, left wing, fourth line. Okay. And, and with that, then, like, is he a guy that you'd put in front of the net on the second power play unit? Because I just, I don't no. want to see Smakeout come up. Well, I don't want to see him come up and play four minutes. Like, that's not, you're not going to know anything of what you have with this guy if he plays the same amount that that fourth line's played the last week. Yeah, maybe eventually, Ross. But, I mean, he just got called up. There's no practice. I don't think you pop him in there up against Detroit right away. Interesting. Because, yeah, th- they need to figure it out. Like, the power play... They didn't get one last night, right? But what they, they did got, do they, they, they got one on at five. the end of the game. Yeah. Well, no, but that's not considered a power play. But I get it. A man advantage for sure. No, no, no. They they had the power play. Simon Benoit with 50 seconds left. It was a 6-4 right. at the end. But they didn't score on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that was that's the only power play opportunity. Right, yeah. Because yeah. it was the ballet of Ontario. It was literally yeah. two penalty minutes against four. That was the whole game. It was it was a nothing burger when it came to physicality. Whereas when the Sens played Detroit in the first time the season at CTC, that was was great. There was a rivalry yeah. to that. There was like great. you know some some hatred, and that's hopefully what the Senators can bring into tomorrow because they have to do something to push through and, and get you know, back to five hundred is one thing, but to get a consistency in the details of their game. And and that's something that's really been missing here for the senators. Like Kubelik's the guy in the top nine though, that I'm just really looking at and mean like, what are we doing here? Like the, he had that little, little bump where he scored twice in the win against Toronto, that six, three win, but it's been so bad since like, there's no B game for him. No. If he's not scoring, there's nothing going on. He loses every puck battle. It's just like, I don't know. I'm I'm about at the tail end of, of my experiment with uh, with Dominic Kubelik as a top nine player on this team. And maybe this is where you're, you're calling Chicago over and over again. Be like, don't you need a veteran? Don't you need a veteran? Like, hey, can you take him, please, please, please? Um, well, and they're familiar with him. Well, exactly. I mean, he scored 30 goals there and he has that upside. Like he yeah. has skill. It's just maybe not 30 goal upside anymore, but like he scored what 20 last year. Like, yep. I don't know. It's just not working. It's not working with him. And sure. You can point to the fact that Ridley Gregg's just getting back into the fold. And, you know, he'd been playing with the, you know, offensive uh, juggernaut of Rourke Chartier before that. But um, side note, before we get to Detroit, 
Uh, who would have thought that Vladimir Tarasenko and Tim Stutzla as a partnership would work? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's wild that Tarasenko was buried on this lineup for as long as he was. But yeah, I, I don't know what they're going to do with Kubelik Ross to answer your question there. Um, I will roll this into my locked on player. How about that? I'm going to go with, we're heading to Detroit, right? Yep. Let's go with the Michigan man, Josh Norris. Uh, I, I thought he's looked a lot better recently uh, up on that line with um, Brady Kachuk and Claude Giroux and up against the Detroit Red Wings in six games, career games against the Wings. He has five goals and three assists, so eight points in six games. So let's see if uh, some home cooking back in Michigan will help get Josh Norris going even more here. So Josh Norris, my locked on player. I like that. I'm going to go with another man with some Michigan ties, and that's because he was the captain at the U.S. National Team Development Program for two seasons in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm going with Jake Sanderson, who the Detroit Red Wings passed on at fourth overall. They decided to select Lucas Raymond. So all in all in good fun there. But uh, so Jake Sanderson has three career goals against Detroit in six games. That's more goals than he has against any other team. So there's that kind of in his corner. And he's got two against Washington as well. So it's not like that's the only team he scored against multiple times, but four points in six games against them. He's plus five. He's averaging 22-22 and uh, has 12 shots on goal in those six games. So I'm looking for him to take the reins here now with an extended leave of Thomas Shabbat once again. I'm looking for Jake Sanderson to continue to build on his performances of late. So I've got Jake Sanderson as my locked-on player to watch. As we turn our attention to the Detroit Red Wings, it is Dylan Larkin leading the way, top-line center. And we do want to say as well that our thoughts are with him and his family. It came out last week. He missed a couple games. Uh, They had a a stillborn and unfortunately had to say goodbye to their baby at, at about a week. And, you know, obviously something that's way bigger than hockey. So uh, we're hoping that uh, him and his family are, are, you know, getting the support they need in in such a difficult time, but it is, it is good to see that he's, he's in a a mental space where he's ready to come back and play for the team that he's the captain of. So we're thinking about Dylan Larkin in in, in that respect. And he's always a tough matchup for Ottawa. He's going to be centering the top line with Robbie Fabry and Lucas Raymond. The second line for now with JT Comfort out with injury, it's going to be Joe Valeno, who dominated Ottawa in that first game where I think he had two goals in in the first game against Ottawa and then wasn't very good in uh, in Europe. Oh my goodness. Is this Alex DeBrinkett on the second line? Is he okay with that? Did they, did they ask him if he was okay with that? I guess what they had to do is bring in his, his old buddy, his old running mate to allow him to play with for him to be okay with that. So Alex DeBrinkett's at left wing on the second line with Patrick Kane on the right side. Patrick Kane was minus one, no points in uh, his debut with Detroit. And again, that's a tough hip injury he's coming back from. One that no player has really had a lot of success from coming back, but we'll see how Patrick Kane Kane continues. Kane's dominated the Ottawa Senators over his career. 33 points in 21 games. Three game-winning goals in there as well. The third line is Andrew Kopp with Michael Rasmussen and uh, David Perron. And then Christian Fisher is centering a line of Clem Costin and Daniel Sprong. On the back end, it's Jake Wallman with um, with Moritz Sider. It's Ben Sherratt with Jeff Petrie. And it's Shane Goss to spare with Justin Hall. Uh, James Reimer has not played since the Tim Stutzla Shohei Otani goal, but we expect it to either be Vili Husso or Alex Lyon in net for Detroit. Who is your lookout player? And some overall thoughts on this lineup for Detroit. My lookout player is going to be Mo Sider, Ross. I feel like the last couple times the Sens have played, he hasn't really kind of been a dominant player, but I feel like he's someone that's kind of just waiting in the weeds here because, ironically, the game where they score five goals up against the Sharks, he wasn't a part of any of those goals, even though he gets five shots. But before that, he was on a four-game point streak with five points in that stretch. So this is a guy that he can pick up uh, speed and he can get hot. And last time they played, actually, he uh, Moritz Sider almost played 30 minutes. He played 29, 53. So he was out there a lot, just didn't really kind of provide much. And then even, well, the game before that, when Red Wings won five, two, he had two assists. So a little more luck there, but Moritz Sider, like that back end, uh, there's a lot of uh, mixed reviews about how Detroit's uh, back end is, but Mo Sider, when he's on his game, he can be a big factor here. 
Yeah, one guy who has been a big factor, at least offensively from the back end and, and played really well when they've played Ottawa so far this year is Shane Gostas Bear yeah. running the power play. And, you know, he just adds such an element for them. He's almost at a point per game. Now, he has only one point in his last five games. So clearly it's been drying up uh, ever since. Maybe he's he spent them all because he had six points in two games. He had a four point night against Minnesota. Was that the game? I think it was. Oh, they had three power play goals in that game. Yeah, Minnesota's power play is a mess. That was the game. Um, it was at Little Caesars Arena, so it was, wasn't was in uh, in Europe for that one. I don't think they actually played, just like Ottawa and, uh, and Toronto didn't play. But if you look at uh, at what the Detroit Red Wings have, it's it's a perfect blend right now, I think. of They've got like their actual checkers, but they've got checkers who can actually play a little bit too. Clem Costin's a guy with, with some NHL skill. Christian Fisher, we saw that great backhand feed he, he had in the first game against Ottawa like the little behind the back, behind the net, uh, out on the short side. So he's got a bit of skill too. Uh, Andrew Kopp, I know from his time in Winnipeg as well, he's kind of a jack of all trades, master of none type player. And then Rasmussen, um, you know, he, if he can convince Brady Kachuk to fight him again, I mean, that's a win just getting the two guys off. Same time, but I'm going to be watching. Uh, I'm going to be watching for Shane Goss to spare a little bit in this game, uh, more so just as a guy who you know he's he's got offensive talent, but you also kind of want to dump the puck in his corner because you know minus player the last number of years in his career, and also a guy who um, you know not the sharpest in his own zone. There's a reason why he's not making you know six million up in a top four, and for a guy with 19 points in 24 games which is pretty impressive for a defenseman. Um, I'm going to be looking for him as, as a guy who potentially could be exposed in his own zone. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously Patty Kane, newest Red Wing uh, in that game up against the San Jose Sharks. Uh, he ends up with no points, dash one, three shots in 16 and a half minutes. I think this is going to be, I think it's going to take, weeks maybe even a month or two for patty Kane to get back to speed here as that was his first game since april uh so it might take some time but you still you got to be aware like all patty Kane needs is a bit of space in the offensive zone and he can cause damage maybe not with his speed but his hockey iq and his shot are still a- among kind of the top ranks in elite point getters in the NHL. So you do need to keep an eye out for him, but I don't think he's going to be uh, a terrible threat right away. I'll probably have to eat my words. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't clip that one. Red Wings fans, you know how much <laughs> yeah. you guys love this show and giving it to us after a Red Wings win, but you guys were quiet in the chat and the postcast after the last game in, uh, in Europe, you guys really left us alone. I wonder why I wonder why we'll be in the postcast again tomorrow. So we can chat with you there. It's a seven o'clock East. Eastern start, and this is the first seven o'clock Eastern start between the two teams. It was a matinee the first Saturday, or the second Saturday, the first after the home opener um, in in uh, the season, and then they played in Europe, obviously, which was I think a noon Eastern start. So, hey, the bright lights of Detroit, original six team, brand new building. Looking forward to this one, and again, we'll have the postcast for you afterwards with Pilsy and I. Okay, P- Pilsy, what's your final thoughts on today's show? Um, we talked about JBD getting his first NHL goal, Ross. I feel like we, uh, you had it on Twitter, but we hadn't talked about this on the show. Shout out another Nodak player getting their first goal. Tyler Clevin in Belleville scored his first goal last week and it was an absolute beauty. So I wanted to make sure as uh K train stands like we are, we got to give him some credit, even though it's a little bit late here. Some, some belated credit for the K trains goal. I love it. I love it. And it won't be soon or won't be too long before we see him back up in the National Hockey mm. League. So, yeah, looking forward to seeing them continue. And Belleville got a big win, man. They need yes. to string a few together down there as well because things are already starting to look um, ominous. I think would be fair to say, and they don't have games in hand to fall back on, but things are really close right now. A couple wins in the next few games. They're at four, four, one, and one in their last 10 games, like very mediocre. So it's about winning a couple in a row and feeling good about themselves. They are hosting grand rapids tonight. So the baby sends against the baby red wings before the two big clubs get together on Saturday. Make sure you're following along on Twitter at send central for all the Shohei Otani updates that your heart desires. No, I kid, but we will have full 
um, game day preview stuff for you after the morning skate uh, in Detroit tomorrow. The Senators are skating at, I believe, 1130 a.m. in Detroit. It will be an 1130 skate. So we'll let you know where Yuri Smekal fits into the equation and a whole lot more. I will be back in Winnipeg and we'll be ready for the postcast tomorrow when the Senators take on their division rivals, the Detroit Red Wings. The Senators record against their division right now is not up to par. So they've got to clean that up and an opportunity tomorrow to get two big points against the Detroit Red Wings. For today, we say goodbye. Thanks for watching today's episode of Locked On Senators. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day.